Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, in the next yeah, 15 minutes, if I can somehow make it, um, I'm going to catch you up on a few new developments in open access that uh, that will be of interest to you. Um, it's a little bit of a, a carrot and stick scenario, or should I say stick and carrot scenario. Um, the first part is going to deal with new rules that uh, come uh, pertaining to open access publications that come from the SNSF. Um, but the second part, and, and that's for me perhaps the more important part, um, I want to I want to quickly point out a couple of um, possibilities that go hand in hand with these with these changes. So so here we go. We have a couple of new rules that came online um, this year. Um, it was announced uh, relatively late last year uh, by the SNSF um, in a press release that they have um, altered their open access requirements. This is affecting any um, funding scheme that was approved in 2023. So any any other um, research project that is already running or started earlier than than January this year is not affected by this. They will be playing by the by the old rules. But anything that is approved this year and going forward will have to will have to abide by a new set of open access rules pertaining to the publications that result from that project. Um, the two things that are uh, crucial here is that in projects that are approved as of 2023 or later uh, must make their uh, peer-reviewed research articles available in open access under a CC by license. You might know and remember that up until now, it was possible to use different Creative Commons licenses, more restrictive Creative Commons licenses. That is no longer the case. Um, the SNSF has always preferred a CC BY license, but for new projects that uh, that start funding um, as of this year, um, CC BY is obligatory. And the other change that is coming that is important is that uh, there will no longer be an embargo period. That means that if you want to make your research results available, these are peer reviewed. Uh, journal articles, if you want to make them available in open access, they have to become available immediately. In other words, if you publish in a subscription journal and you want to uh, make use of self-archiving and go the open access green route with an author accepted author accepted manuscript, that has to become immediately available upon publication of the um, publisher version. So these two things are important. They're pretty, pretty uh, significant changes to the open access policy. And we're going to have a look at, uh, at what that means in more detail, particularly the second part, which I think is a little bit more confusing uh, before we move on to the possibilities that come with that. So Let's go back to this to this notion of open access green and self archiving sticking your author accepted manuscript into a repository and make it available there for open access up until now and you will know that if you did that um, uh, your your um, publisher contract would most of the time stipulate that there is a certain waiting period, right? So the publisher publishes your, your article in their version um, uh, uh, for a subscription fee. And after a certain amount of time has gone by, 12 months, 24 months, however long, you can then use your author accepted manuscript and uh, make it available in a repository. This is, as of now, no longer the case. And the reason why, um, well, the reason why they're doing it is because they want to have immediate open access to 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 the to the research results that they funded but um, the way they came to this decision is by signing a coalition s um, uh, that is the uh, that is a, a conglomerate of national research founders across europe and they have developed this 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 policy to bring open access forward now they 
don't just leave you standing there in the rain saying, you know, um, well, you know, you might want me to publish in open access immediately uh, if I go the green route, but how can I if the if the um, if the publisher doesn't allow me to? And the idea that uh, that goes hand in hand with this requirement is the idea of rights retention strategy. What is that? The idea is pretty much, uh, and you see that on the left-hand side, this is what uh, this is what the Europeans cooked up, um, that you are supposed to be enabled to exercise your rights to your work from the moment that you submit it to the publisher, right? So that you can say, it is my manuscript, and if I so choose, I will deposit it on a repository uh, as soon as it appears in print as well and make it available in open access. And the way this SNSF has formulated that, and you can see that in their press release, is that on submitting your manuscript researchers, they reserve the right to make it freely available with immediate effect under CC BY license, citing their commitment uh, to the SNSF. That is the fundamental idea behind it, so that they don't just say that, but there's also a legal dimension to how you can go about that. Now, what does that look like in practice? Um, uh, you know, just because the SNSF and some other funders say they want it so, it doesn't make it so. Um, and the path that the SNSF and the, their colleagues at the um, at the uh, in Brussels uh, came up with is to add a, a, a passage to the manuscript that you hand in to the publisher. And that passage reads as follows. I have it only in German here. I didn't find the English translation. I'm going to give you a quick translation here. Basically, the gist of it says um, this research was uh, uh, funded uh, in whole or partially by the Swiss National Science Foundation, here's the grant number, to ensure open access, um, there is going to be applied a Creative Commons CC BY license to, and here it comes, any manuscript, uh, authors accept this, uh, author accepted manuscript that will result from this submission. So from the moment you hand this in, you put this in your first footnote or into, into, into the acknowledgements or wherever, but this is part of the submission that you give to the publisher. And the idea is very much that this precedes um, any kind of uh, any kind of agreement that you might then make with the publisher that requires you to wait for 12 or 24 or however many months. Um, so that's 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 the idea, right? That's the idea between rights retention strategy. There are certain things that are staying the same. Um, the SNSF will continue, of course, to fund APCs. If you don't want to have to deal with all the open access green manuscript fiddling, um, and you want to go straight ahead and publish the whole thing in open access gold with a CC BY license, the SNSF will pay the APCs, the author processing charges, as long as you publish in a pure open access gold journal, right? And uh, by the same token, what is also staying the same is that in the end, the SNSF doesn't really care which path you choose uh, to make your research available in open access, they accept all of them, whether you go to an open access gold journal, if you go into a hybrid journal, which is where the rights retention strategy comes in, or if you go open access diamond, as long as you have this work available in open access, and as of 2023 with a CC BY license, you're good to go. I appreciate that for any researcher that can just become increasingly tedious to have to to balance all these rules and 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 they're changing and then there are new ideas and you somehow have to maneuver that and it costs you time and effort and nerves and 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 use um and it is it is annoying but i think it is worth thinking about the fact that these sorts of changes also open windows of opportunity for you as researchers um, uh, individually, but also for scholarly communication overall. Right? With the rights retention strategy, if, if this, I'm saying if this, but if this were to become ubiquitous, um, then we have a real possibility of disrupting the communication market the way it is right now. Because what it basically means is that your research is going to be available uh, for free to you and the reader uh, immediately upon, upon 
um, publication. And that that is that can be a game changer. That is that is that is definitely something that could be disruptive. Um, but more than that, for you as as a researcher, what is really worth thinking about is that that you retain the rights to your work, right? You don't sign it away. All that you would give, technically, legally speaking, to to the to the uh, to the publisher is uh, is a non-exclusive usage right. They can print it, but they don't determine what can happen with the text, with the work that you have, have created. And that is definitely something worth considering. So this is one, one possibility. And you've seen that I've, I've, I've called this slide new possibilities beyond APCs, APCs author processing charges, because quite frankly, it is uh, turning into an unsustainable situation. Um, I'm going to show that on the next slide again. Um, and, and this right retention strategy might just be the way forward in, in, in terms of hybrid journals, particularly to, to break that stranglehold of, of costs that, that everybody's facing. There is another path and that's a diamond open access. I have to mention that because it is a very hot topic right now. Again, uh, the European uh, uh, Council is discussing this at, uh, at great length at the moment. The, uh, the idea that neither author nor writer should have to, uh, a reader should have to pay for access to publicly funded research results is becoming more and more center center piece of of European considerations. So, and for you as researchers, my God, can you imagine? You don't have to come to coffee lectures like this anymore. You don't have to worry about about a, a contract nonsense. You don't have to worry about embargo periods, rules that the funders have versus rules that the university might have, and prestige stuff that you have to worry about. Um, no more administrative burdens trying to find the funding to pay APCs, and that's diamond open access. That means that uh, neither you as an author nor you as a reader will have to pay for it, and surely that is something that everyone would like to, to move towards. As I said, here is the problem. This is a this is a post on Mastodon last week um, that just illustrated. I mean, three thousand five hundred dollars for an article. You know, if you're a PhD student, you don't have you don't have any funding uh, to 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 that tap into. That's a huge bill. I mean, it's stupid, right? And we don't know why these things are as expensive as they are. Um, and they have uh, it. Just it's just one of the big problems that we're facing with the at the moment prevalent business model in open access publishing um, and and we have to break that and diamond open access is uh, in, in in many ways open access done right because it is then equitable because it is available to anyone uh, and not just to those who have that kind of money sitting around either in their institutions or in their funding budgets or in uh, you know in their personal bank accounts because Open Access Diamond is young and because we have learned a lot of lessons from how not to do it with APC-based Open Access, um, Diamond can do better. And there's a lot of, a lot of movement behind this, behind this new path to, to Open Access. It's community-driven in terms of financing. That means that, um, that the, the, the business models are very much trying to find transparent financial um, uh, uh, sustainability models that are financed by, by institutions and by libraries, for example, in terms of content, and that's what is important to you. This stuff is scholar-led, so it isn't driven by, by interests um, to make as much you know, money as, as, as is possible, and, and so on. The challenges that are being faced at the moment in terms of, of Diamond uh, Open Access Publishing are sustainability, that's clearly the case. Publishing costs money. If you want to do it community-based uh, in terms of publishing, how can we get everyone on board to make this a reality? That we're not that far yet. That's not your headache. That's the headache of libraries who are who have the means to to support these kinds of schemes. Your your responsibility as 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 researchers lies very much in the issue that many of these journals that are um, trying to walk the walk um, are not as accepted amongst researchers as the big prestigious titles that charge an arm and a leg, but are firmly in the grip of of um, 
of of the big publishing houses. So um, so this is where you can create. This is where you can. Uh, this is where you can shape a little bit what the uh, the the communication landscape um, is going to look like in the academy and in your field. And I appreciate that you are bound by things like impact factors and and prestige. We are in a prestige economy, but at the same time. You can you can try and look out for for these for these better ways of 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 doing of doing scholarly communication. Support that either with one or the other um, publication, or as a peer reviewer, or even who knows as an uh, editorial board member. Um, so food for thought. I hope that you you don't just see this as as a as a as a nuisance coming from some funding body, but also as an opportunity for you as, as researchers to, to help shape um, the way that we communicate research in the future. Thank you.